Well, super excited to be talking to you guys today. For those you know, watching this video, the three of us connected kind of in different ways through Cal. So Cal is a great connector and in that regard, we wanted to have this conversation talking about the current job marketing and what's been working for people, what are different things should, we should be considering. And hopefully this is just a nice, fun conversation and shows the power of networking, which is going to be one of the, the themes that uh, we're going to talk about. So we'll start off, go around, introduce ourselves, uh, make sure um, everyone knows who we are, and we'll go from there. So my name is Matt CV. I am the uh, founder and coach uh, my code career, helping people land their dream jobs three times faster through today tactics in the job market. I'm also a director of engineering at Celestia Labs. So one of the reasons we connected with Callum because both in the, the Web3 space. Callum, I've mentioned you like three times now. Why don't you, why don't you kick it out? Awesome. Great to be chatting with you guys. I'm Callum, Callum Crombie, co-founder of Calypsis. We are a hiring platform powered by AI and on-chain credentials. So we aim to be the, the world's go-to source of, of verified professionals where a job seeker can build immediate trust with employers through their verified skills and their social reputation. Employment fraud is a, a huge issue and using blockchain technology, we can massively improve trust. We can shorten interview processes. Our aim is also three times faster math and ultimately make, make finding a new role much more simple and more rewarding. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I'm excited to hear more about that on-chain ver the verifiability of, of, uh, ex experience and how, how you guys are working on that, but we'll, we'll get into that. Sorry, Mike, cut you off. And I am Mike Mastari. I'm also director of engineering. I spent the last couple of years working at Chingy Labs. I much like Matthew do advisory and coaching as well in my independent business. And yeah, very excited to talk with you guys. Uh, my piece is going to focus on a lot of behavioral interviews. I have a communication background and a leadership background. So I'm very passionate about cultural interviews, behavioral interviews, and technical communication, not just technical skills. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. So very excited for this conversation. I'm going to start things off kind of sharing some themes and things that I've been seeing, especially across LinkedIn and other career coaches, you know, working with people and, you know, the last year and a half has been you know, really tough in the software space, right? People, you know, people are, I think a little bit caught off guard sometimes, right? Because there's been periods in the past, you know, even like four years ago, five years ago, where if you had software engineering, your title, and you flipped on the open to work on LinkedIn, you just like started getting flooded with inbound offers. And the, and the idea of having to like put in a lot of effort into your job search is like kind of a foreign concept in, unless you were going for one of the fangs, right? Like that was kind of like the only reason, you know, someone was like, oh, I'm got to really like buckle down and, and work hard and like get into one of the fangs. I got to do all this prep, but it seemed like everyone else was kind of in this you know, nice, nice, happy state of like, oh, I'm a software engineer. I've got a couple years of experience, open to work, offers, new job, great. So then, you know, the last year and a half when the market's been a little bit of a downturn, there's been lots and lots of layoffs, lots of competition in the market, you know, that just hasn't been the case. So people have been really struggling sometimes to understand, okay, like how, how do I actually do this? Right. So I'm talking with other career coaches in this space, you know, there's one way to simplify things down in the job market is there's a lot of different bites out there and that there's only two ways to get a job. Either you ask for a job or someone asks you to do a job, right? That's the only two ways. And so we can think of those two levers and like how we can go after those. So us asking for a job, that's, you know, applications, that's networking, trying to get referrals, right? People asking us for a job is our existing network, right? People that we know and also our professional brand or professional identity, what, what we are known for, right? And when we think about those, then you know, three tactical actions, right? Applications, networking, and, and building your exposure. Only two of them have also kind of long-term compounding benefit to your career, right? And so, you know, I call myself a career coach not a job search coach because I you know, believe the job search is just one part of your career journey, right? Sometimes in order to improve in your career, you got to find a new job, right? Other times you're forced into it, but it's still a you know, part of your career journey. And so that networking and building your brand exposure are ways that help you in the job search, but also help you long-term in your career. 
and so talking with other coaches, you know, it's a lot of the, you know, same, same ideas that what is working in today's market is networking and kind of building that online presence and using, you know, a lot of people using platforms like LinkedIn and, and things like that, but also I'm excited to see how Calyptus on-chain verifiability helps kind of like, you know, make, make that kind of like professional exposure and professional like identity more concrete. Right. So in that, you know, when a lot of people still just like come back to just applications because I think they don't know another way and kind of like struggling of why, why applications don't, don't work and kind of like why there seems to be so much competition. And some of that comes down to all of the tooling that has come out over the last like decade, really around making it easier and easier and easier for people to apply has now kind of also inflated that competition, right? Because it is easier for people to apply to places, people apply to more places because people are applying to more places. Every role has more competition, which then forces people to apply to more places. And it's kind of the self-fulfilling competition of like using these easy apply options, then just make everyone is applying just so many more jobs, right? As opposed to everyone only applying for the jobs they actually want. And then there ends up just being less competition. So that's a kind of, yeah, and meta you know, trend it's, it's, we've been it's interesting because you find yourself applying for a job and there's a hundred other people, maybe 10 of which are actually qualified. So it becomes a game of also tailoring your CV and tailoring your application so that it can pass the automated screening and it can actually show your qualification. I wanted to build on top of what you said about networking. Ultimately, networking is useful not only when finding for a new job, but also when having a job, like we all have jobs, we are, you know, successful or, you know, I consider myself moderately successful people, but this call is a direct consequence of our networking and our collaboration is that, so there's always opportunities to learn and there's always opportunities to improve. I never thought about networking with some sort of goal in mind. To me, networking is also a way to give back to the engineering community is also a way to know more about the trends and know more about what's changing. So I couldn't agree more. And I think that now the job market makes it so networking is necessary and, and tailoring your job application is necessary, but it's much more than that really. Yeah. And I think what you mentioned there about like networking with a goal in mind, right, is where some people get tripped up, right? Because even though you know, I'm saying a lot of coaches are saying like, use networking to find a job. The, the like initial goal of networking is not to like ask for a job, right? You know, when people are, when I, a lot of times when I'm talking to people and he's like, oh, are you networking? Yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm DMing hiring managers, like posting owners, like asking about the job that I applied to him. Like that's following up on an application. That's like a verbal, that's like a verbal application, right? Like that's not a network, right? The, the point of networking is what you talked about, Mike, is that it's learning, engaging with the ecosystem, building your connections, like, you know, finding these people that you can learn from and get back to and things like that. Right. So the goal of networking is always that building of a relationship. And then once you have that relationship, that is then something that you can then kind of pull from to potentially get referrals. Right. I think that's another way that a lot of software engineers, I think have a lot of software engineers, especially have this kind of fear of networking. It's like, oh, like I'm not, like I'm not a people person. Like I don't, you know, I don't like, you know, kind of like you know, talking to people, but there's also, you know, even the most kind of reserved engineers that I've worked with, you get them talking about a topic that they're interested in and they're incredibly animated. Right. And like, that's, that's the point like find, find that thing that you enjoy and find someone else that also enjoys that and have a conversation that is networking. You know, it, it, it's as easy as that, you know? Agree. So, I would, I would also add there, Matt, that networking doesn't have to be in person. You know, it's great that you can go to conferences and the like, but you can do a lot of networking on social media, on Twitter, on Reddit, join, you know, the Ethereum dev channels on Reddit, comment there, participate in discussions and you know, so much of Web3 specifically is it's open source, which means that you can contribute without even speaking in a lot of, in a lot of senses, you can build a profile for yourself. 
outside of actually needing to be after conference. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I think and it's important that people realize that they don't necessarily need to be traveling and, and meeting people in person, though I definitely wouldn't recommend it. Hundred percent. Yeah. And kind of, you are like a top blockchain voice and on the hiring space. So I'm going to just drop you the first question of the session, which is, do you have a golden process when networking on blockchain? There's obviously the web tree space is huge. There's a lot of companies, there's a lot of noise. What is your way or what is your recommendation when networking in the web tree space to filter out the noise and actually do meaningful connections? It's a good question. I, I honestly, I don't think there's a right answer. I think it's a lot about, um, taking your time and, and as both of you already said, contributing to things that you actually care about and are interested in. If you are speaking to someone or if you are contributing on GitHub or, or somewhere to something that you care about, then that is going to be impactful and you're going to be creating the right type of connection connections with people that care about the same stuff that you care about. Um, you know, I'm, I don't particularly enjoy going to conferences and, and kind of butting into conversations and have it, you know, it, it feels so awkward to me, but that it, that is important. And I think particularly once you've done a bit of online networking first and you find a very small tribe of people that you, you're agreeing to meet up with at Eat Denver or whatever it is then you have that base to build on and those people inevitably know other people and kind of your, your network can just build pretty organically as opposed to needing to force things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you enjoy conferences, man? I, so, so on conferences, I think the, it depends if I'm, you know, there with people that I know, I think like the, I'm definitely, I, even though, you know, to most, most people might say that I'm a rel relatively animated and engaged per person. I think it's still like that, you know, walking up to like random people at a conference and talking to them, I mean, like it is hard and it is, it is scary. Right. And so I think having, having something to solidify, like the engagement around is something that I think is actually easier online than in person. Right. Cause in person you have, you have nothing to go on except that you're at this conference. Right. So maybe you can connect with somebody that that's in the same talk as you, like you walk, you know, and you can be like, Hey, let's talk about this second online. You have so much more information to go off of, right. Whether it's you know, on LinkedIn, you've got their whole profile and be like, Hey, like I saw you worked here. Like that's awesome. I really like that project. Like, can I talk to you about it? Right. Or as Kyle was saying, you know, on GitHub, like if you just find projects that you like and start contributing and then. Most of the times they've got their website link, they've got a discord or something that you can then start engaging with, with people in the product. And like, that's that kind of open source, like those, then finding those communities is a really powerful kind of like tool of both building your online kind of professional brand and experience, like showing all these contributions to open source, but also then finding connections with the community that you actually like and, and, and networking there. Another question for Callum. The uh, is, I think there's, and for your, the platform Clyptus, I know you kind of talked about having a little bit of an ecosystem there and some of like the on-chain verifiability stuff, wondering how you see the Clyptus platform being a form of networking and also offering that kind of like professional identity thing. It's, it's, it's something that we considered a lot over the last two years since we, since we started, we actually began life as an education provider. We spotted that engineers in, well, employers in crypto wanted to hire experienced engineers, 95% of roles were for seniors. If you look at education in this space, it's very catered toward the junior end of the market. So there was a gap there to create more advanced education around solidity, around rust, to help people transfer from great tech companies into the world of web three. So we thought a lot about education and how we can use education to lead to jobs. And very quickly that became a lot more about building a community as well. So we definitely see Collective as an ecosystem with jobs at the very heart, but then education, community events, 
kind of all ancillary to that and leading towards that big moment, which is the, your, your next role. So for sure, very, very important um, on, on all aspects there. And we want to make sure that people are coming to Clifton, not just when they need to find a role, but when they want to speak to great career coaches, like the two of you, when they want to skill in a particular area, uh, or when they want to bring their credentials on chain right now, the way that particularly tech assessments work in interview processes is that you might need to do the same tech test three or four different times for three or four different companies. Exactly the same tech test on hacker rank or fidelity, for example, when the name spake uh, a few weeks or months for us, that's, that's just crazy. So we want to be able to provide a way for candidates in particular to go to one place to take their assessments, to bring those assessments to their CV, to have that, that CV on chain and those credentials on chain, and for them to share that publicly, not just in the collective ecosystem, of course but anywhere that they want so that their, their results are verifiable and, you know, an engineer improves over time. So you're always going to want to re redo those assessments and, and recate those assessments, of course. But what's important is that we want to be saving candidates time and ultimately for employers, providing we can build assessments that work for them as well, then that the, they trust, uh, then ultimately we're saving them time as well. And we're providing them with a lot more trust that the people that they are inviting to interview are actually going to pass their technical test. So hopefully we save them time, we save them money, and we make the experience a whole lot better for both, both parties. So trust minimize tech assessment in a way, right? So you, you just take it once and then all your job application, they have the tech assessment attached over to that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Prove yourself want to be employable forever is, is the tagline, Mike. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, it kind of, I know something that, you know, it was like LinkedIn had like the skills assessments, but I think like those have actually, I think, gone away, right? Like, I think they, they discontinued them for, for whatever reason. And so I think that was like LinkedIn kind of attempts to, you know, have some sort of verifiability, but I don't think anyone really, you know, used that. And so, because just like LinkedIn, but I just think for, it's like built building on like the blockchain ecosystem that like loves verifying things on chain. I think it's a re it's, it's such a great way of implementing that. And I think there's, you know, a, a lot of people that are looking to kind of like level up their skills, like, to, you know, do things. There's also always like, always the question of like, should I get the certification? Like, do people care about the mm -hmm. certification? Like, does it matter? Right. And it was really unclear kind of like how that relationship, you know, between getting that certification, like getting a job. And so really excited to see how the Eclipsis on-chain verifiability of your skills is, is going to be adopted by the market. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and yeah, just, just to share very quickly about kind of the future iteration of this is to bring a lot more credentials on-chain. So bring your AWS cert certifications, bring a lot of the things that you would typically have, you know, in some folder hidden away on your laptop into your CV. I mean, we only launched a couple of weeks ago, the, the, the kind of credentialization side. So there's, there's lots of improvement to come, uh, but please do check the platform out. I was going to ask the both of you, I suppose, just before we kind of start talking about the interview side of things, how important do you both think things, how important do you think for an engineer is to be on LinkedIn and to build your profile out on LinkedIn? Yeah. So this is the great question that I work with people on in terms of which platform is going to be good for you. Right. And so if you're in web two, I would say LinkedIn is still very good because like, that's where like m most companies have a presence there and over and over and over again, you see people engineers getting hired from LinkedIn because they're like sharing, you know, building a project, they're engaging on other posts, like they're building that profile, right? Web three, not the place, right? There's there, you know, web three companies just like are on LinkedIn in the same way. Right. And so 
finding other platforms, you know, whether it's clip this, whether it's just being on active on GitHub and like, honestly, that GitHub is probably the most prominent profile for a developer. Um, in either case, right. I would say if you're web three, you got to have a strong GitHub profile. If you're web two, you probably need a strong web two profile, right? Cause more web two it's closed source. So they don't have the same expectation about having a GitHub profile or web three is, you know, pretty much all open source. So they expect to see those contributions, right? And so it really depends. And this is where like in both situations, having an online presence is important. Knowing which platform is going to be right for you based on the job that you're searching for is then like the key differentiator, right? And so the, that's kind of like, you know, when people are like working through it, it's like understanding what's, what's the goal, what are you working towards and understanding the right tool platform that's going to like help support you there, right? So LinkedIn, GitHub, you know, whatever it might be. Mike, curious if you got any thoughts on that. Yeah, one thing that I discovered when I joined Web3 for the first time was the high use of Twitter, right? which is really not a thing in Web2. Web2 companies do not post on Twitter. Uh, Web3 companies, Web3 leaders post on Twitter all the time. And I was a very mild Twitter user before then, and now much more active because of it. I got a lot of very interesting connection and people in my team as well got a lot of interesting connection through Twitter. Lots of side projects spun up. I think that that is really where a lot of the buzz is. And then GitHub is definitely important, I agree, for the engineers. So the software engineers, the individual contributors, uh, GitHub is the, the place to go. I think that for everybody, engineers and non-engineers, Twitter is probably the most active Web3 forum nowadays. Yeah, I guess I definitely agree. I think LinkedIn is is it's a nice to have and a, a clean LinkedIn had some posts and comments about what you're interested in is great, but I would completely agree that GitHub first and foremost, if you're an engineer, is somewhere you should just be and you should be trying to commit regularly to open source projects and Twitter are exactly the same, Mike. I was I was kind of an external user. I use Twitter a lot or X a lot in the run-up to starting Clipters, but I didn't post. I was very much kind of watching. Uh, and only now have I started to to kind of post myself and get involved in loads of connections of country Twitter um, for ups at Clipters, lots of partnerships. So um, would highly recommend. I guess, you know, we've spoken a bit about how to stand out and and get that first interview. What's your, what's your top advice once you're in that first interview and maybe starting at the very beginning of the process, which is from my experience, more often than not a, a cultural type interview where you're perhaps meeting the hiring manager or someone from HR or the talent team, and it, it's a bit more behavioral, um, and less tech or experience focused. What, what's your the core advice there, Mike, perhaps? I love behavioral interviews because not only, you know, it gives people the chance to know the company, right? But at the same time, it gives you the chance to showcase whatever you're the most passionate about. There are tips, obviously there is, there is a way to approach behavioral interviews, which is somewhat optimal, but my biggest advice would be research and be honest. Like that would be, if I had to say only one thing, it would definitely be that. Obviously, you know, behavioral interviews consist of a number of things and an interview with an hiring manager and an interview with a recruiter or with a peer, maybe another engineer, which is not a technical interview or a product manager, they have to be approached differently. But in my opinion, there's always two or three things, right? I tend to ask a lot of questions. I tend to research the company and try to understand what they value more than what they do, right? What they do. It's always on the website, what they value is usually perceived and transmitted through the process of interview. And finally, be concise, always, you know, use the star method in the answer. So situation, task, action, result. And I also add I at the end, which is impact. And the, the, the result and the impact of two negative. Nice. So, so I think that's a really yeah. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask a question in there. You kind of briefly mentioned the idea of like a first conversation might be with a recruiter or a hiring manager. And so I think, so I kind of posed the question to both of you. 
I know, I know Callum, like through Clyptus, you know, you guys have you know, recruiters that you're working with. So you, you guys, I'm sure have a, you know, a pretty set kind of like kind of interview format that you use to like screen, screen that first, you know, first call with a potential candidate. And then Mike, like ask someone that's done a lot of hiring, like, you know, maybe got a lot of those first interviews. I'm curious to hear kind of, and you know, Callum and then Mike, you know, curious, like how you two, like, what are you looking for in those first interviews? And I'm curious to see, you know, what overlap there is and like, and what I might expect is that they're, you know, they might be quite different. So, so Cal, Cal, I'd love to hear kind of what's, what do you look for? Like when, you know, your kind of recruiting team is looking at candidates. It's a great question. And it's, it's really difficult to nail down. We, you know, we've been growing a lot recently in Eclipsis and we're bringing on more team members and, and trying to coach them how to, how to spot great people. And it's tough. There's, there's a lot of things that you look for in a LinkedIn profile or on GitHub that aren't immediately obvious. Aside from you want someone that's committing a lot, using the programming languages that are most relevant in the space, languages like Solidity and Rust and Golang, but also the more traditional JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, etc. So it's a lot about looking for skills for us when we're kind of deciding who we, who we might want to speak to. And that's why providing a way for people to verify those skills is really important because it helps us to understand, okay, how good really are they at X or Y. So a lot about skills, a lot about kind of where they worked and how long they've been there. It, you know, generally, and it will be great to get Mike's thoughts on this, you know, Really, you want to see that someone's worked for companies for a solid amount of time, been able to contribute to projects more significantly than just for a few months. We also, I guess, look for things that make them stand out, whether that's an amazing company or whether that the fact that they are a thought leader on Twitter or LinkedIn or somewhere, things that make them a bit different and are likely to, uh, I suppose pique the interest of, of a hiring manager who actually, you know, we've got to remember that hiring managers are seeing dozens, maybe even hundreds of CVs for just one role that they're hiring for. Um, it's really important to, to find candidates that are going to stand out to them, even if it is only for that very, very fast stage, just to get them in the door and, and on a call. And then all the things that Mike already mentioned, like research and asking questions, I think are so, so important, but I will let Mike kind of answer, answer that side of it. Yeah. Job hopping, big red flag. So if, if someone stays in a job six months to a year and they just move and move and move, eventually that catches up with them. Maybe they move for money. I, I had an engineer specifically that I interviewed once that every summer without fail, they were changing jobs <laughs> and it, I asked them. Why do you change job over summer? And it turns out that they didn't work 12 months a year. They just work 10 months a year. And they were taking two months break in the summer. And then they would find another, another company, which, you know, it's not really the definition of commitment, right? Uh, it's, it's definitely not, not a great thing. In my perspective, I do not really assess technical skills, right? Even when I interview director of engineering or product manager or, or engineering managers, people leaders, technical skills are usually assessed after. And a mistake that I see a lot of people making is that they focus exclusively on the tech. They come to the hiring manager interview and they tell me why they're good for the job, right? Which is really not what I'm interested in in that moment. I want to understand why they're interested in the company, why they're interested in the job before figuring out if they're good or not for it. I want to understand what they value, what their passions are, what are their, you know, what's their ethic? What are their, what's, what's their ethos? To me, I have two or three things that I really care about in people. Uh, one is ownership. I like people that take challenges and problems and, and want to solve them and not pass the ball and, and offload responsibility, but then again, responsibility. And, and, and control the, the result and control the problem. And the other one is really focus. 
in the world, it, it may be a bit redundant to say, but in the world today, there's a lot of distractions in a company. There's shifting priorities all the time. There's always people that shout at the biggest fire and having, you know, especially software engineers, they are later focused on what's actually important and what they actually have to do. It's, it's a big thing that I, that I care for. Nice. Love, love both of those answers, right? Like, and, and I think that was like what I was hoping both of you were going to say, like Cal was very focused on like, how do we, you know, from the recruiter aspect, when you're trying to like pitch someone to a company, like you gotta, you're trying to build that confidence that like, they are who they say they are. They've got the experience. Like they've got, they've got all the hard stuff and tech, like, you know, check, 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 check. Right. And then, you know, Mike, like once you're like in the company, it's just like, okay, yeah. like like we've already covered that stuff, right? The fact that you're in the interview is like, I've already kind of like, I believed that like those boxes were checked, right? Whether a recruiter passed you on, whether I screened your res you know, resume, your ATS, but like now that you're talking to me at the company, like why, why this company, why this role? And so I think that, you know, that, that change is really important. Something you mentioned, Mike, about kind of like, you know, looking at people's like backgrounds and, and like the job hopping thing, that there's a couple different, you know, things that people are sometimes like concerned about, like on the background, like, oh, like I've, I've had, you know, like I, I had to take a couple, like, you know, shorter roles. Like I, like it might look like I'm job hopping or like, oh, I've got this like break or like, oh, I have my, you know, X, Y, Z thing that like they're worried about their background. Right. And how, like, you know, how to address that. And so there's, you know, if you have, and this is kind of like recommendation for, you know, people out there, like if you've got like a, you know, a break in your background or you have a couple like short-term roles, right? There's usually a reason for those things, right? And so most, most of the time people's initial like reaction is to try and hopefully they don't ask me about this, right? Hopefully they just focus on the stuff, you know, this stuff, right? Um, but then like inevitably, like you're going to get asked them, right? And so this recommendation, like I always give people is like lean into that and like address that first. Right. And so, you know, great examples, like, you know, for like job hopping, right? Like there's a number of reasons, like maybe, especially if you're working at startups, like maybe the company was only around for a year. Cool. That's a totally reasonable thing. Like that's like not that person being, you know, you know, n not committed. Like it's like, I wanted to commit company didn't exist. Right. Or, you know, a lot of things like, you know, career breaks because of, you know, taking care of family members, like a kid, like older family members, or, you know, I've worked with people that have had a career break because they, their partner got a job in the state. So they moved there and they had a longer visa process. So they just couldn't work. Right. It was, it was out of their control. Right. And so, you know, how do you kind of then talk about, you know, we know what to do there. So in, in that, so, you know, in that frame, then the kind of leading toward the question that I wanted, I wanted to ask is what are, when kind of like looking at someone's background and kind of, you know, hearing them like talk about it, you know, what are some things that some really like standout candidates have like done in the past, like how they talk about their background or how, you know, they kind of address some of these, you know, concerns in your experience, Mike, like, I don't know if there's past interviews that you've done. It's like, oh, like that, like the way that person like talked about their background, like just like it made everything so clear. Like now I totally understand why their background looks the way that it is. Yeah, this is an excellent question. And the answer is very simple, right? Usually when people are confused by people answer is because they did too long or they are not to the point. So understanding the question, understanding, especially the motivation behind the question is the key here. There is a method uh, I mentioned it before. It's called star in which if people ask you a question, you just talk about the situation and then you talk about the task that you did, sorry, the, the, the task at hand, the action that you did and the result of the action. I'll give you a 10 second example, right? Super common question interview. Tell me a time in which you handled a significant, you know, priority shift. You can answer as a software engineer by saying, oh yeah, we, we had in this company, we had a lot of shifting priorities and then we talked about it and then we fixed the problem and eventually we managed to deliver everything on time, which is a somewhat suboptimal answer. Or you can go dark, right? You can just say, okay, when I'll give you my example, right? When I was head of connectivity at Trey, we were developing a bunch of connectors and we had to do 30 a month. One month, 
big client comes in, Salesforce in my case, and they want work that will take 75% of the team for the OMA, right? This is the situation, right? So what's the problem? Then you go to the fast. And you say, okay, I, as a director of engineering, had to quickly shift the team priority and make sure to either deprioritize something else or to figure out a way to deliver it. So this is the task, what you had to do. Then you go into what you did. Right? You say, okay, I called the team meeting after the engineer scoped everything. And then we sat down okay. and we figured out with our product managers, with our CEO, with whoever, what were actually the most important thing. We figured it out with the go-to-market people to understand if the Salesforce deadline could be pushed. Turns out you could not push. So we had to deprioritize something else and insert the Salesforce, but we reset expectation to the customer. So the result is that we delivered on time on the new priority, which was more important. And the customer that got delayed was informed beforehand and they managed to have a plan to mitigate the delay. This is a 30 second answer that gives you a very clear indication as an iron manager that the person that you asking the question to understands what the problem was, understand why it was a problem, took a specific action and understand the, what the result of the action was. And, and this is invaluable to me as a higher manager is probably one of the two or three most important things that people can show. Yeah, that was really, really great example. And I, and I want to touch on something as it relates to like preparing, preparing for those questions and then kind of like shift to how, you know, the interview, we need to prepare questions as well. And so one of the concerns that like a lot of people have, like in the job search process, like preparing for interviews is feeling like they have to like re-prepare a lot of this stuff all the time, right? Cause you don't know the questions that the company is going to ask. You don't know, like, you know, they could do anything, right? So it's like, how do I prepare a star example for everything? Right. And how I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Mike, how I have kind of recommended people solve this, right. Is that, you know, remember, remembering that like the, the kind of bucket of information for answers is finite because it's your experience. Right. And so, and if you are targeting roles that are building on your past experience, which you should, right. Then you know, the answers you should be getting ahead of time, right. You know, it's like as a director of engineering, going for a director of engineering, like you need to prepare leadership style questions, right? So like preparing that answer could probably be your answer for lots of different types of questions, right? And so, and you might just have to shift the focus a tiny bit based on how the person asked, right? Maybe if they were like, hey, you know, the focus was like, tell me about priority shifts or tell me about a time crunch or tell me about competing priorities or tell me about a time you had to do uh, a lot of things and like, you know, figure out like how to bring in external stakeholders, like all those different types of questions, your answer would have solved all of those. Right. And so that, you know, for people that are preparing, like having, what are your core experiences, prepare star examples for that, and then just make sure you're matching it to the right question. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Mike, if you have any other like thoughts, like you know, people. a great mentor of mine told me is not what you say, it's how you say, and you know, those people that tell great stories, right? Imagine a party, I can move away from the, like you're in a party, there's a group of people, there's one person that's holding everyone's attention, they tell a great story. And I found myself thinking so much, oh, how much would I like to be that person? I thought I would love to be the person that just sits in a room, gets asked a question and can tell a great story about it. And I have a trick that I started doing because of this mentor of mine, which is I write it down stuff every day what I did and what, what I enjoyed and how I perceived it. And I guarantee that if everyone goes, does that, there is a story that come out of it. And then once you have the story, so once you have the content, as you said, at the end of the day, it's your experience. It's a finite bucket of experience. It's just about how you say, it's just about how you present it. And you can present any content with the star method. You can answer any question. The trick to me is remembering that it's your experience, right? You don't have to make up anything. You just have to tailor your answer in a specific way. So that it's easily understandable and it's well-structured. 
Yeah, I think there's a, I believe there's a quote, don't know who it's from, can't remember the exact words, but the general theme of it is that like the story only makes sense in retrospect, right? And so yeah. like, as you're, as you're living your story, right? Like, you know, it's hard for you to understand how all these pieces like fit together, right? And it's only in retrospect that it's like, oh, like it's so obvious that I am here and able to do these things like because of like how all my things are together. So I want to, I want to maybe like finish or kind of close the things up a little bit, like with one, one final question on this part around, you know, questions that you should be asking the company, right? Like when you're interviewing, like you should be. And one of like the, the first things I always try and like tell people is like, please do not ask question. Tell me about the culture, right? Because, and even though culture is very important, people always want to find the right work culture, things like that culture, it's too vague of a question. Right. And so the problem that then comes when you ask vague questions, like tell me about the culture, right. Is that you're going to get a vague answer that might, and you're, it's going to come off as disinterested and ungenuine. Right. And so the ultimately people have defined the culture that they want in their heads that they're looking for. So instead of asking, tell me about the culture and hoping that it like matches, ask specifically, do you do this thing or do you act in this way? Right. And so curious and, and you know, Callum, cause I know one of the things that recruiters do a good job of is like trying to like prep people for the interviews. Right. And it's like, you, you know, curious if your team has any kind of you know, methods that you work with the people on or like how to think about like, what are the questions that they should be asking that they want to get, you know, confirmation on and a feedback on how they might ask those questions. Yeah, definitely. So, so important to be, to be asking questions at the end of an interview. It just shows that you care and that you, you want to be there and you're not just taking this because it's another interview and you know, you need a paycheck. I think asking questions specific to role specific to company or specific to, I suppose, team, I think is really important. And the, the key there is being specific about what you are asking for. Just like when you're creating your CV, you should try and use numbers, you know, quantify the impact that you have had at the various companies that you have been. Similarly, when you're asking questions at the end of an interview, as you just said, Matt, you can't, you can't just ask what culture is. You need to say, you know, if over the next 12 months, if I am to be successful, what will I have done and where will I be, you know, put that, put, put the interviewer under pressure, ask them a question that they probably haven't heard very many times that makes them think about you being in that role and you being in that role for a year. What does success look like after a year of being in this position and get them to tell you because you can then use that information in, in future interviews, repeat it back to them. So I think, yeah, generally one, always ask questions Two, try and make those questions as specific as possible. We'll talk about some of the things that you've seen in the job description or the mission or the vision of the companies. And again, try and quantify what your impact could or should be over some period of time and, and get them thinking about actually working with you. And, and what that might be like. Yeah. And, and ultimately, you know, that question is a way for you as the person that's being interviewed to know what you actually want to And the, the culture, you're going to figure out how the culture is doing it, right? But what are the success metrics? It's a completely different thing. Like my golden question is very similar. And it, if I get hired today, what is the single most impactful thing that I should do or fix for you specifically? And, and it's phenomenal as an engineering leader, because you can ask a software engineer, you can ask a product manager, you can ask a CEO, they're going to give you three different answers. And, and that helps me piece together in my head, what people care about and what the things that I can actually help with are, which is what I personally am interested in. But yeah, great, great to be coming. Come. Do you have, Matt, one golden question before we wrap up? I don't have a golden question, but I will highlight something that I think your question did really well. And it ties together something that Callum always recommends. And then something that I also recommend is that, so your question was, tell me like how something that I need to do to be successful in this role for you. Right. Yeah. And so it is specific, it places you in the company, right? So just imagine you there. 
And then most importantly, in my view, it, it, it is directed at the individual of the interviewer. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then you're getting the interviewer to talk about their experience, to talk about them. Right. And the more that you can get the interviewer to talk about them, you know, typically the more they're going to enjoy the conversation. Right. It's so like, you know, think about like talking to somebody, you know, at a party, right. You know, you're, you're like, if you, if you're grilling them about stats, about the house you're in, like the, you know, some, some like abstract thing that they know about, but like, isn't them, they're going to be like a certain level of engagement. You ask about them specifically, they're going to be higher level of engaged. Right. And so finally making sure the questions that you're asking, right. Are both, you know, they're specific, they are related to you, but also related, related to them. Right. And so instead of tell me about the culture, right. It's like, Hey, tell me about, and tell me about a time where like you felt really supported by the company to like, take like personal time. Right. Yeah. So if like work-life balance is important to you, that question is going to be super impactful to you understanding how the company supports personal time and also is asking the question directly to them. And so the, yeah. So, uh, any, any last thoughts on, on your end, Cal? Cal? I was going to just ask you both one question. You've, you've clearly had very successful careers. You are now supporting lots of other people to, to break in through this industry and, and any industry really, but you, know, you two have both been very successful in your own rights. And what you have also done is transferred from the world of traditional tech into the world of web three. So I guess I just wanted very top level thoughts on, on what advice would you give to people making that transition? My anticipation is that over the next year, we're going to see a lot of people wanting to make that jump and who better to hear it from than you guys. The, uh, so for me, I kind of like stumbled into web three, if I'm totally honest. Right. So I, so my background, I made, so my background is mechanical engineering did you know, six plus years of kind of process, product management, team leadership, and then kind of tried to switch into software and just happened to stumble into a web three company. Right. And the main reason that happened. And so the reason I was able to do that and be successful was I had a very, even though I was looking for my first role in tech, I had a very clear target in mind for what I wanted this role to be and like what I wanted my career to look like. Right. And so at that time, it was like, I wanted to be, you know, very backend focused, right? I was interested in, you know, low level stuff. And I wanted a team where like I could bring in my project management team leadership stuff. And in that interview, even though this was, this was for, you know, I was employee number six at this company and they were took the interview at their living room table because they didn't even have an office yet. I still showed up like, and told them like where I want to go with my career is like, I'm going to be the like, EP of engineering someday for you guys, right? Like that was like, that was my vision, right? And so for most detailing that out is like one of the most important things. And that's what I work with people on the most, especially trying to like make some transition, right? Is that the, like the transition is just a step in the road, right? Like, where are you going? Why are you making this transition, right? Because if, if we can't paint that longer picture, this first step is going to be harder, right? Because if you can't, if you can't look farther down the road, this first step looks huge. But if this transition is just one step in a longer vision, then it's, it's much smaller. It's much more manageable. And like the mindset around it is then much more confident. Yeah, I agree. You talked a lot about the long term. So Kangom, I'm going to give you the short term answer. So what people have to do right now. And to me, it two things. Understand what the transferable skills that they have are from Web 2 to Web 3 doesn't lock. Right? If you want to deliver software, you just deliver software, right? Regardless of whether it's a smart contract or it's a, a you know, a class on a distributed system in a regular API, right? The second is learn because there's a lot of information and web three now it like web two was probably when Matt and I started, right? So it was, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of stuff that's changing the advantage that people have now, it's something that Matt and I did not have, which is this, the amount of accessibility to this information. It's not difficult to find information. Now the difficult part is to filter out the noise. For us, probably it was more difficult to find the information to begin with. 
we have three days a lot to learn. And I would just say, keep the things that you are good at and the things that can be transferred, then learn the new things that you're not good at with humility and, and with passion. And people are going to be fine. Right. Awesome. And of course, right. join Clipdesk. So that's, that's yeah, the answer that we were looking for was join Clipdesk and that's how you get into Web3. So this has been an amazing conversation. So we'll wrap it up by giving you guys an opportunity to kind of share, you know, if people like what you were saying, wanted to reach out to like learn more, how should they do that? Go, you know, go Callum, Mike, and then we'll come back to you. Sure. So I would say head to the Calypsis website. We are at calypsis.co. That's like, it's a very difficult one to start. So we'll just have to put it in the description, wherever yeah. this is being posted. Yeah. We should have thought about last. Or grab me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Callum Crombie. Yeah. Pleasure speaking to you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Likewise. Been great conversation. We should do much more of them. Uh, for me, very easy. Mike Masari on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or MikeMasari.com. Whichever people, media people prefer, whichever social media people prefer, I'm pretty much on all of them under my name and surname. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Same, same thing here. I'm most active on, on LinkedIn. You can find me there just by searching my name and my handle is just my last name. I managed to secure that early on. So proud about that. And right. then also if you're interested, got a free school community that you guys uh, can join school slash my code career. I'm super excited to share resources in there with people and excited to meet everyone there. Great conversation. See everyone later. See you later, folks. Thank you. Bye-bye.